Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, a weekly show with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott. For our main topic today, we're talking about wake turbulence, because I had an encounter with wake turbulence last week, and we're going to talk both about wake turbulence accidents, what causes wake turbulence, and what you can do to avoid it. And of course, if you're thinking about buying a newer used Cirrus or Cirrus Vision Jet, call me today, 650 967-2500 for free consultation and possibly free demo flight. Last week in episode 137, we talked about special VFR and offered some guidelines for when to use it and when not to use it. So if you missed that, you may want to check it out. And just a quick note, I received an email last week saying that Aviation News Talk is the number one aviation podcast in Apple Podcasts. Very cool, since there are over 200 aviation podcasts. So my thanks to all of you for making us number one. And if you haven't done so already please click the subscribe button in whatever app you're listening to us now. That way you'll get notified when new shows are available and it costs nothing. Yep, that's right, zero to hit the subscribe button. So please do it now. This week in the news, if you have ADS-B out, the FAA says don't turn it off or else. Some aircraft can now talk to the tower digitally and we'll tell you how. And a hunter's gun brings down a helicopter. All this and more and the news starts now. From planeandpilotmag.com, turn off your ADS-B, go to jail. Maybe not, they say, but you could be in deep trouble with the feds if you go stealth. Here's what else might happen, too. There seems to be a lot of concern among certain segments of the flying population about the way the FAA is enforcing ADS-B infractions, and according to reports from several posters, there appears to be some truth to it. It's really not a new problem. If you have a transponder and turn it off, regardless of what kind of airspace you're in, you can get dinged by the FAA with the suspension. Several folks have mentioned six months being the length of time if the FAA puts its foot down on your certificate. The language of the policy letter dated January 24th of this year is ominous. A friend of the magazine posted this recently. It says, quote, single acts of misconduct generally warranting revocation. Some acts of misconduct are, by their nature, so egregious or significant as to demonstrate that the certificate holder does not possess the care, judgment, or responsibility to hold a certificate. And number 30 on that list is operating an aircraft without activated transponder or ADS-B transmissions for purposes of evading detection. Now, the issue raises a few good questions. The article says, if you don't plan to fly in ADS-B required airspace, should you install it just to be safe? The FAA's hardline stand on this makes it a far more difficult question to answer. On the one hand, when flying in the backcountry, Who wants to think that your every maneuver is being monitored, at least potentially, by the federal government? On the other hand, the risk of collision down low might be slim, but they are not unknown. And ADS-B has free weather, too, though you can always get that with a portable receiver. And I should mention, by the way, portable receivers don't pick up all ADS-B traffic from other aircraft, so don't think that that's a potential alternative. And the article continues, and if that's not enough to concern pilots, the FAA is, according to reports, using ADS-B to monitor pilots whose flying is reported to them. According to one poster, the agency regularly has inspectors monitor a suspect's N number flying activity as part of its investigation into pilots or aircraft that have popped up on their enforcement radar. And the article finishes up, if you really want to stay off the FAA's radar and you don't need to fly in ADS-B airspace, don't equip if that makes you feel better. And if you have already equipped, keep it turned on potential grief, at least in our mind, far outweighs what might otherwise have been a little peace of mind. And from FlyingMac.com, another FAA story, FAA's Datacom Tower Service now available at 62 U.S. airports. As part of NextGen, Datacom is saving time for crews flying equipped aircraft. When H.R. 2115, the Vision 100 Century of Aviation Reauthorization Act, was signed into law in December 2003, it endorsed the concept of a NextGen system to be developed by the FAA. A month later, the Department of Transportation Secretary announced plans for a new multi-year, multi-agency effort to develop an air transportation system for the year 2025 and beyond that would increase efficiency in the National Airspace System, or NAS. NextGen would not be just one technology or product, the bill stated. Instead, it was conceived to be a portfolio of innovative new technologies and airspace procedures to increase NAS system efficiency and capacity. One of those innovative new technologies that was born out of HR 2115 is now in use at 62 U.S. airports, and that's Datacom Tower Service. 
With this technology, FAA is revolutionizing communications between ATC and pilots by replacing voice communications with digital tower-to-flight deck messaging that saves time and reduces miscommunication between controllers and pilots, known as talkback readback errors. In order for a flight crew to utilize Datacom, the aircraft must be equipped with Future Air Navigation System 1A, abbreviated FANS 1A, which includes CPDLC and Automatic Dependent Surveillance Contract, that's ADSC functionality. According to FAA's next-gen implementation, an incentive was initially offered to eight operators to equip with Datacom avionics, resulting in 2,400 equipped aircraft. Now approximately 6,000 aircraft are equipped overall, exceeding the goal of 1,900 Datacom-capable aircraft by 2019. A joint FAA and industry analysis was performed at five airports in the NAS, looking at the first two months of the 2017 convective season, and the report revealed average taxi-out time savings between 0.2 and 8.5 minutes per rerouted flight by utilizing digital datacom communications. Over the life cycle of the datacom program, FAA estimates that more than $10 billion will be saved by operators and approximately $1 billion saved in FAA operating costs. An FAA spokesman said, that since first going operational in 2016, Datacom Tower Service has saved 2.02 million minutes of radio communication time on 7.28 million flights, and that 111,000 possible talkback readback errors have been prevented. And the article finishes up by saying a longer-range goal of the next-gen program is to provide en route services using Datacom. And I must say, I'm looking forward to that coming to more aircraft. I would certainly like to be able to communicate with ATC digitally, especially on long trips across the country. From AOPA.org, AOPA pitches IPC reforms. The FAA should permit pilots who must take an instrument proficiency check before acting as pilot in command under instrument flight rules to use aviation training devices to meet their regulatory obligation, AOPA said in a filing proposing major reforms for the IPC. AOP also proposed eliminating the record-keeping requirement for logging 30-day VOR checks for IFR navigation, which is something we talked about here several months ago. Bringing ATDs online for use in IPCs would require dropping the requirement to land from an instrument approach, a mandatory item on an instrument rating practical test that is not required by regulation on an IPC. And just to clarify this, ATDs are the lower-level flight simulation devices that you'll find often at uh, flight schools. Those cannot be used for circle to land. However, some of the million-dollar type uh, simulators that you would find at Flight Safety or even at Cirrus for training of the Vision Jet pilots, those are certified for use with circle to land. Continuing on, AOPA has pointed out that the relevant instrument flight skill to be reviewed on an IPC is not the landing, but is the pilot's transition from flight solely by instruments to visual flight. A related reform to make ATD use possible would be scrapping the circle to land procedure from IPCs, an improvement that would reduce training cost, add efficiency, and conform to the industry's goal of encouraging stabilized approaches as circling procedures are phased out of use. Now, we've talked a lot on this show about the importance of stabilized approaches, and I'm sure I've mentioned to you that one of my personal minimums is that I will not do a circling approach at night if there's any kind of significant weather. And of course, since WAS came out and we now have LPV approaches to both ends of virtually every runway that qualifies here in the United States, there's almost never a need to circle anyway. And the article continues, currently regulations require an IFR pilot who has failed to meet the instrument experience requirement of Part 61.57 for more than six calendar months to reestablish instrument currency only by completing an instrument proficiency check. In most cases, The check must be completed in an aircraft that is appropriate to the aircraft category. Removing the circle to land and landing from an approach task would allow the IPC to be completed entirely from an ATD, saving pilots considerable time and money while maintaining and possibly improving both the safety and proficiency of the pilot. We believe this request is in line with the FAA's strategy to transition away from circling procedures and their goal of encouraging the use of ATDs, AOPA said in its submission. In addition to tasks considered unnecessary for proficiency, AOPA has noted that some record-keeping requirements also serve no useful purpose. In November 2019, AOPA submitted comments supporting a petition for rulemaking from a GA pilot to eliminate the logging of the 30-day operational check of a VOR for IFR operations mandated by FAR 91.171. 
AOPA noted that the logging requirement is an unnecessary burden on pilots and serves no practical safety purpose. And from flymag.com, ATP and SkyWest enhance tuition reimbursement program. The cooperative program provides financial assistance to qualifying students. ATP and SkyWest Airlines have enhanced their tuition reimbursement program, which provides financial assistance to qualifying students with its Airline Pilot Hiring Partnership. Candidates enrolled in the training organization's Airline Career Pilot Program can now receive up to $17,500 in assistance and take advantage of the partnership's fast track from graduation to employment. The Jacksonville, Florida-based ATP trains approximately 1,600 students at any given time at its bases around the country. In an interview with Flying Magazine, ATP's marketing director, Michael Arnold, said the company has placed 700 students into airline pilot slots last year. The company has also joined forces with United on its Aviate program, where students and instructors at ATP can apply for flow-through positions with the airline and gain experience using airline protocols while still in training. Another cooperative agreement with regional airline Endeavor was also announced on February 14th, and a base opening in the northeastern U.S. is imminent as well. Arnold also watches for another milestone to pass for ATP. It currently counts 399 aircraft in its fleet, with orders in with Textron and Piper for 100 aircraft from each OEM in the coming years. ATP will tick over 400 aircraft in the near term. From AOPA.org, this is a follow-up to a story we reported last week. The Collings Foundation works to resume passenger flights. The Collings Foundation has resumed its long-running Wings of Freedom tour and hopes to resume passenger flights aboard Vintage Warbirds in March, following a temporary stand-down to address detailed questions from the FAA about flight operations following a tragic crash in October. The Wings of Freedom tour was suspended following a crash in October that killed seven people, including the pilot, co-pilot, and five passengers who purchased a ride aboard the Boeing B-17G bomber 909 at a tour stop in Connecticut. The FAA has since been reviewing the organization's exemption that allows the group to offer passengers who pay $425 or more a living history flight experience. The organization suspended the Wings of Freedom tour following the crash and later resumed a more limited schedule of airport visits without offering the passenger experience opportunities. The schedule as of February includes Four upcoming events, Dallas from March 11th to 15th, Eden Prairie, Minnesota in July, Akron, Ohio in August, and Cape May, New Jersey, where my grandmother used to live, love Cape May, in September. The 2019 schedule included more than 50 tour stops. And also from AOPA.org, new online pilot information center launches. Ask just about any aviation-related questions, and we will have an answer and resources for you. Now you can get those answers easily through our online Pilot Information Center, an online Q&A platform that replaces the AOPA hangar discussion area. The Pilot Information, or PIC, keeps everything from the AOPA hangar, dashboard, members area, groups, events, and marketplace, and it enhances the discussion area. AOPA hangar users can use their existing login, Members who haven't used the platform can log into the PIC with their AOPA.org username and password. The Q&A discussion area is similar to Quora. That's a popular online platform for people to ask questions and share insights and knowledge and will allow you to submit your own questions or browse popular categories of questions from other pilots and see the answers and resources that AOPA's experts provided. It's another avenue for you to connect directly with AOPA on a personal level You'll interact with the experienced staff on our PIC, the Pilot Information Center, the folks you currently chat with online or email, as well as other AOPA subject matter experts and editors. You will also be able to connect with other pilots by contributing answers and resources and voting questions and answers up and down based on how much the information helped you. Popular discussion categories focus on flight training, aircraft and equipment, legal and insurance, medical, ratings and certificates, drones, and air safety, among other topics. From EAA.org, applications for EAA's 2020 Sport Pilot Academy now open. The benefits of immersive small group flight instruction are coming to Oshkosh again in 2020, as EAA is hosting five Sport Pilot Academy sessions this year, beginning in May. The EAA Sport Pilot Academy offers a direct path to Sport Pilot certification through a three-week training program that eliminates obstacles such as scheduling conflicts and instructor availability. The program takes participants from the first flight through their sport pilot checkride at EAA facilities in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. 
quote, the success of our previous Sport Pilot Academy sessions over the past two years has encouraged us to expand the program to five sessions in 2020, said Sean Elliott, EAA's VP of Advocacy and Safety. The Sport Pilot Academy is a way for those committed to learning to fly to earn that pilot certificate with a strong support system around them at EAA. The three-week program offers one-on-one and small group instruction with flight training in New Vans RV-12 IST aircraft equipped the latest Garmin avionics. Lodging, meals, and camaraderie with fellow students are all included, as well as additional aviation experiences that can be found only in Oshkosh. The 2020 Sport Pilot Academy sessions will be held on these dates, May 9th through the 31st, by the way, which is their one Collegiate Sport Pilot Academy. And they note here that the Collegiate Sport Pilot Academy is a scholarship-based session with up to five scholarships awarded to students attending a post-secondary institution and focusing on an aviation program such as aeronautical engineering, aviation management, airframe and power plant maintenance, and more. The other sessions are June 6th through 28th, August 8th through 30th, September 5th through the 27th, and October 3 through the 25th. Applications for the first session will be accepted through May 20th, 2020. Complete information and requirements are available at eaa.org slash sportpilotacademy. And of course, we have a link to that in our show notes. From avweb.com comes a story that's related to something I mentioned last week, the Gulfstream G700 flies. You may recall that I recorded much of the podcast at Monterey, where I walk through a full mock-up of the G700. Now, according to this, Gulfstream's new flagship G700 business jet had its first flight last week. The flight lasted two hours and 32 minutes and covered all the basic flight characteristics and system checks. The company says it's on track to deliver airplanes in 2020 under an aggressive development campaign that it also managed to keep under wraps for months. By the time the new model was announced at NBAA last October, The five test articles were already under construction. They're all finished now, and the structural test airplane has already finished load testing. The first airplane to fly was also the first one finished and carries the tail number N700GA. It flew on a mix of Jet A and sustainable aviation fuel. The G700 is the largest aircraft the company has built, and it's 110 feet long, with interior configurations for up to 19 passengers. The interior can be split up into as many as Five zones and a private suite is one of the options. It has a maximum range of 7,500 nautical miles and will cruise up to 0.925 Mach. Maximum takeoff weight is more than 100,000 pounds. Its full fuel payload is about 2,300 pounds, and it's powered by a pair of Rolls-Royce Pearl engines. In international news, and this comes from flyer.co.uk, Flyer Magazine, thousands of UK pilots may be grounded over the PMD issue. Well, it says thousands of pilots could be affected when a CAA exemption, which allows UK pilots to fly EASA aircraft in the UK with a self-declared pilot medical declaration, or PMD, expires on the 8th of April. So far, the official line from the CAA is, we are working with the government to see if there is a way forward to enable pilots to continue to fly EASA aircraft using the self-declaration process. As many as 8,560 pilots are believed to have made a PMD, If the CAA is unable to extend the exemption, they could also be queuing for a Class 2 medical, applying for a LAPL, or grounded. The exemption may be complicated by the UK leaving the EU and thus no longer being represented on EASA committees. The UK's future position within EASA has not yet been decided, though Flyer Magazine has heard that between the end of January and the end of December this year, which is the transition period, the UK will continue to apply the UA Aviation Acqui. And by the way, there's a note here that says Acqui means accumulated legislation, legal acts, court decisions, etc. that form EU law. So they say the UK will continue to apply the UA Aviation Acqui in the UK, both in terms of regulations, certificates, approvals, etc., and that nothing will change. If that's the case, then the UK government may decide not to extend the exemption as it is outside the current EASA regulations. And finally, from generalaviationnews.com, a hunter's gun brings down a helicopter. The pilot of the Robinson R-22 helicopter was taking a passenger up for a hog hunt flight near Wadsworth, Texas. As he lifted off the ground about 40 to 50 feet AGL, the passenger's gun became lodged in the cyclic control. He instructed the passenger to move his gun multiple times, but the passenger seized up in panic. The helicopter hit the ground and the fuselage and empennage sustained substantial damage. 
The pilot reported that there were no pre-accident mechanical failures or malfunctions with the helicopter that would have precluded normal operation. The pilot reported that it was the second hunt with a passenger and that he had provided a safety briefing before the accident flight. He added that during the safety briefing, he discussed gun safety, when and where to shoot, and instructions on avoiding areas with the flight controls. He added that as a safety recommendation, he will conduct a more thorough safety briefing, including an on-ground engine-off cockpit simulation and a lesson on firearm safety. Probable cause was listed by the NTSB as the passenger's gun becoming lodged in the flight controls during takeoff and his failure to remove it, which resulted in impact with terrain. That's the news for this week. Coming up, my weekly updates. And then we'll get to our main topic, which is wake turbulence, all right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Now let's get to our fun flying destination. This, I think, is our first one from Europe. If there are other folks in Europe who'd like to submit some, please record one and send one over to us. So my special thanks to a new Patreon supporter, Sebastian Schön, for sending this to us from Deutschland. Hey Max, that's Sebastian from Germany. I'd like to contribute a European fun flying destination. Um, it's the airport Lido next to the Venice, the Italian city. The airport identifies Lima, India, Papa, Victor. It's just about an hour and a half flight uh, over the Alps from my home city of Munich. It has a neatly um, um, groomed uh, grass runway of 2,700 feet. It's really next to the city, has spectacular views on approach. You see Venice, you basically circle Venice on approach. It's really easy to fly in. Um, the only thing you have to know is that you are, know the local reporting points, its um, city names, and be prepared to report estimated times over because you have to cross controlled airspace and the Italian controllers, for some reason, always want to know your estimated times over. And yeah, you can have a really good time there. And uh, if you want to, you can get yourself the James Bond treatment, call the tower and ask for a water taxi, which will pick you up right at the airport. And it's just a 10 minutes ride uh, into the city and all the small canals. So it's great fun. So thanks for all the good work. I enjoy listening to your podcast and keep up all the good work. Thanks so much, Sebastian. And Sebastian sent us a link to the airport's website. Now, it's in Italian, but when I opened it in a Chrome browser, it offered me an opportunity to translate it in English, which made it quite readable. So I'll include a link to that in our show notes. If you'd like to send us a fun flying destination, just use the Voice Memos app on your phone, record less than 90 seconds, and email it to me at aviationnewstalk at gmail.com. Now, let's look at a couple of articles I came across this week. <laughs> this one really hits a hot button for me. I'm sure you'll figure it out from the title. This comes from generalaviationnews.com. Pilot looking at iPad hits another plane on the taxiway. Okay, <laughs> we knew it was going to happen. The chief pilot of the flight school at the airport in Brunswick, Georgia, reported that the pilot receiving instructions was taxing a Diamond DA-42. Now, that's a twin-engine aircraft, which tells me this is a licensed pilot. <clears throat> which means you should know better, uh, to the runway at the non-towered controlled airport and was heads in looking down and researching information on his iPad when he heard someone yell, stop. He quickly applied the brakes, but the plane collided with an airplane stopped on the taxiway, holding short of the runway. Chief pilot added the flight instructor was inputting radio frequencies and was unaware that the pilot was also looking inside the airplane. Yeah. So we had both people up front looking inside the airplane while the aircraft is taxiing. The instructor looked up just in time to hear the backseat passenger yell stop and see the collision. So the backseat person was the only one watching what was going on outside. The safety coordinator of the flight school that operated the stopped airplane reported that while holding short of the runway and performing the before takeoff checklist, the flight instructor and pilot receiving instruction felt a hard impact from the rear. The stopped airplane sustained substantial damage to the elevator. The safety coordinator and chief pilot both reported that there were no pre-accident mechanical failures or malfunctions with their respective airplanes that would have precluded normal operation. Probable cause, the pilot receiving instructions, failure to see and avoid an airplane holding short of the runway on the taxiway, and the flight instructor's lack of situational awareness. Wow. <laughs> so I got to tell you, I see all kinds of things that fall into this category. Probably the most common thing I see is that soon after aircraft start to taxi to the runway, They'll get a call from ground with either a frequency or more likely with a transponder code for flight following. 
And then I see pilots continue to taxi while looking down and inputting uh, the transponder code or the frequency. And folks, got to tell you, that's the same as texting while driving, which is probably illegal in most states and most countries and a pretty poor practice as well. So I would strongly encourage you, as I encourage all of my clients, anytime you have to write something down while you're taxiing or you have to input something with the knobs while you're taxiing, stop the airplane. It's not that hard. It's going to take just a couple of seconds, and it's a heck of a lot safer than looking down while continuing to taxi. So please, 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 if you see other people doing this, just kind of let them know this really isn't very smart. Otherwise, you may find yourself in the same situation that this poor Diamond DA-42 pilot found himself in in Georgia. Now, here's another article from generalaviationnews.com. LSAs, or light sport aircraft, log growth in 2019. I'm just going to read a part of the article and have a link to it in the show notes for you. It says, as we enter the third decade of the new millennia, new and improved reporting capabilities allow us to quickly report results for all of 2019 for light aircraft industry market shares. Now, we don't talk a lot about light sport aircraft on this show. Certainly plan to do more of that in the future. But if you're interested in light sport, you'll want to read this article. It says that uh, LSAs are well known to nearly everyone in the aviation community. They're described by the FAA's 2004 regulation, although that rule set will go through a major revision over the next four years, changes that will enormously enlarge the segment. LSAs include two main varieties, special and experimental. The former are factory-built aircraft, and the latter are kit versions of the same models. However, ELSA versions can be altered and maintained by their owners, ELSA kits are not required to meet the 51% rule, as it's often called. Sport pilot aircraft are experimental amateur-built aircraft that meet the parameters of LSA in terms of weight, speed, number of occupants, and other criteria. The author Dan Johnson says, I call these SP kits because they can be flown by pilots possessing a sport pilot certificate or by a pilot holding a private pilot certificate or higher who is exercising the privileges of sport pilot meaning no aviation medical is required. Now, he had a helper named Steve who went through all the numbers to try and determine the number of aircraft registrations in 2019, and he says that there was an increase of uh, 795 aircraft, bringing the total fleet up to 8,823 aircraft by the end of 2019. So, again, this is still a relatively small segment of the total fleet here in the U.S., which totals somewhere around 200,000 aircraft. Now, there were a number of charts, and I'll just uh, read the top couple of aircraft in each of these charts. First one was for special and experimental plus sport pilot kits. Number one aircraft was Zenair Zenith CH750. They sold 88 units in 2019 versus 89 in 2018. Number two on the list was the Vans RV12. They sold 59 versus 41 the year before. And number three on the list, the Kit Fox S7 Sport sold 51 units, up from 32 the prior year. And they list a total of 14 models on the chart. Under LSA seaplanes, the Icon A5 shipped 80 units in 2019 versus 79 in 2018. Number two position went to Sea Ray, which shipped 22 units in 2019 versus 21 the year before. They also have a separate chart listing alternative aircraft. And they show that the total of all gyros sold were 60, powered parachutes were 18, and trikes 24. And other the gyro planes, they mentioned the number one on the list was the Autogyro MTO, which sold 18 units. Number two, the Mangi M16 sold 14. And they also mentioned the Tango 2 in third place, which sold 13 units. They mentioned that that's a very capable unit with a 130 horsepower Yamaha engine, sells for about $43,500. So I'm not going to go through the full details here, but if you're interested in light sport, go ahead and look in our show notes for the link to this article by Dan Johnson. And here's an article for those of you who might be in the market for buying a new transponder. This comes from kitplanes.com. It's called their Transponder Buyer's Guide. It says, in part, you still need a solid performing transponder now that ADS-B out is the rule. As proof, we're hearing field reports of new and existing ADS-B out systems flunking performance reports because of mode C transponder issues. The lesson learned for those purchasing remote or add-on ADS-B out technology is that nursing an aging analog transponder might not be even a short-term solution. 
Luckily, there are some affordable solutions, especially when carefully shopping the used market. If you have a new or existing kit to equip for the ADSB mandate, you'll pay a premium for a one-box solution, but it may be the better long-term plan. Here's a scan of the current market. And then the article goes into great detail summarizing all the different solutions that are available for transponders. So if you're thinking about buying a transponder, go out to our show notes and find the transponder buyer's guide. And by the way, to get to these show notes from your smartphone, if you're listening to us on an app, you can just go ahead and swipe to get to the notes from this episode, or you can always go out on the web to aviationnewstalk.com slash 137, which will take you to the notes for this episode. And here's an article from avweb.com that I know something about. It says FAA emergency AD grounds Cirrus jet fleet. After a cabin ground fire destroyed a first generation Cirrus SF-50 vision jet, that was back in late December, and we talked about that here on the show, the FAA issued Emergency Airworthiness Directive AD 2020-03-50, which grounds the fleet of jets until faulty audio amplifier circuit cards are removed from the cabin. In the aircraft that melted on the ramp, the FAA wrote in its AD that the pilot observed smoke coming from the right rear cabin sidewall. The smoking components are audio amplifiers that are used to drive the 3.5 millimeter audio microphone jacks in the passenger cabin. And they give the part number of the defective circuit card, and the AD says to simply remove all 12 of them from the cabin before the next flight. It generally takes eight hours of labor to remove the interior of the circuit cards and put it all back together. Now, just to be clear, these circuit cards and the jacks have nothing to do with the headsets that you use for talking with ATC or talking over the internal intercom. Instead, they are connected to the in-flight entertainment center. So, for example, if the kids in the back were watching a video, they could plug their consumer headsets into the audio jacks. Those now aren't going to work, and I'm sure they'll get re-enabled at some time in the future. Going back to the article, Cirrus has been on this before the AD and already issued a service bulletin, SBA 5X-23-03, for compliance instructions. To date, Cirrus has made 97% of the SF-50 fleet airworthy again through its assist mobile technical team and established service centers. Let's said over 170 Cirrus jets are back flying since the bulletin was issued on February 7, 2020. Nailing the communication effort, all Cirrus SF-50 customers were contacted within 24 hours of the bulletin's release. Now, the two Vision jets I've been flying most recently were fixed very quickly, as were two others that I've flown in the past. One of them went into a service center on Friday and was ready when I picked it up on Wednesday morning. The other one was fixed by a mobile technician who came out to the San Gabriel Valley Airport to work on the aircraft in the hangar. Now, I was curious and wanted to see the cards that were pulled. Each one is approximately the length and width of a pack of cigarettes, but since it's a PC board, it's much thinner, maybe, oh, just a quarter of an inch thick. And interestingly, each PC board was wrapped in some type of thick black plastic that looks similar to a very large piece of heat shrink tubing that surrounded most of the PC board. Now, these amplifier boards are all very low voltage circuits, so at first it seemed odd to me that they could have started a fire. But the fire occurred in one of the very first few aircraft to roll off the production line, and apparently there were some moisture issues in the vicinity of one or more of these cards. And of course, those cards are located in confined spaces where there was no air circulating, which could also possibly have led to some heating that could cause a fire. Now, to be fair, I would say that any new aircraft model has problems after it's first introduced. Boy, just take a look at the Boeing 737 MAX as an example. The issue really is not whether or not they had a problem, but how the company addresses the problems. And of course, in the case of Boeing, I think in retrospect, they probably could have handled that much better than they have because they've certainly suffered some damage to the company and to their brand. But to their credit, I think Cirrus seems to have taken the exact opposite response to this problem by throwing lots of resources at it, communicating continuously about the problem as they worked on it, and instantly issuing a service bulletin immediately after they identified what they thought was the source of the problem. And on top of that, they've implemented the fix in the entire fleet of roughly 170 aircraft in just a matter of a few days. Now, this does take away the ability to plug in and use headsets to listen to the in-flight entertainment system, and undoubtedly there will be some future service bulletin to restore that capability when they come up with a more reliable audio amplifier board. So congratulations to Cirrus for handling this problem well. Now let me tell you a little bit about my vision jet flying over the past week. Uh, in one case, I flew with an owner and his jet to Knoxville, Tennessee via the Henderson Airport, which is near Las Vegas. We stopped in to meet up with Paul Salich of All In Aviation, which is his flight school, which is a Cirrus training center. 
He gave us a tour of the new facilities he's building in Henderson that's uh, being done in partnership with a separate maintenance shop whose name, unfortunately, I don't know. Uh, together, they are just finishing construction of 26 hangars, and these are big hangars. They're large enough to hold a turboprop like a TBM. They'll also house the flight school's training aircraft, and they're finishing a large building that includes a maintenance hangar along with offices for the flight school and the maintenance shop. Plus, I believe they have one unrented office space left. So if you're interested in renting office space at the Henderson Airport, contact Paul Salich at All In Aviation. Now, while we were inside the building, we took a picture of Paul, myself, and the Vision Jet owner, which we posted on Facebook, where I noted that we had 1% of all the Vision Jet pilots in that photo. But we then departed for Pueblo, Colorado, where we refueled and had a hot dog dinner at Flower Aviation, one of my favorite FBOs, which I've talked about before on the show. We then set out for Knoxville, Tennessee. And in en route, we had our eye on a line of thunderstorms that was perhaps 100 miles west of Knoxville. And our hope was that in the four hours it would take us to get there, that the storms would pass over Knoxville, leaving clear air behind them for us to land. We spent most of the flight analyzing the storm and its movement using our in-cockpit weather resources. We could see it had some cell tops that reached 40,000 feet, so this was a fairly intense storm. Cell tops were moving at about 80 knots, but unfortunately, they weren't moving due east. Instead, they were moving mostly north, maybe northeast, which meant that their movement toward Knoxville was very, very slow. And as we got closer, it became apparent to me that we were going to have to divert and land elsewhere. But as I looked at the weather at airports behind the storm, I was really surprised to find that all of them had ceilings of either 200, 300, or 400 feet overcast. And these low clouds extended for hundreds of miles, so it was hard to find a good alternative on the backside of the storm. Finally, I found that Little Rock was 900 foot overcast, which was much better by comparison. So we diverted to there, but that turned us nearly directly into the headwind, which we saw go over 160 knots at one point on our flight at flight level 310. And at one point, I noted that it was going to take us nearly an hour to travel the 129 miles to Little Rock. Now, fortunately, ATC stepped us down early and the winds dropped dramatically, cutting our time to Little Rock nearly in half. And along the way, I'd been monitoring the weather at Memphis. It started at 300 feet overcast and later changed to 200 feet overcast. And that totally confirmed my rationale for choosing Little Rock, even though it was considerably out of the way. I figured that the weather at all the airports that were reporting 200, 300, and 400 foot ceilings could easily get worse, and it wouldn't take much change for any of them to go below minimums. And if we went to one of those airports and then had to go missed, we'd then be low on fuel with few other good options that were any better. So I chose Little Rock because it would have taken a huge weather change for it to go below minimums. And in fact, while we were en route to Little Rock, the weather actually improved to 1,000 foot overcast. So we spent the night at Little Rock and got up at 5 a.m. to fly the rest of the way to Knoxville. But over breakfast, we could see that that line of thunderstorms was just about right next to Knoxville and moving very slowly. So I went back to bed for a couple more hours, and at 8.30 a.m., we reconvened. By then, the line of storms had passed over Knoxville, and the front was starting to weaken with less red convective color in the radar returns. And as is usually the case after a storm passes, our flight to Knoxville was in perfectly clear weather up until the last few miles when we ended up descending to fly an approach into runway 23 left. We then headed up to the Vision Center for lunch, where I also saw many of my friends who work there. I apologize, I can't remember everyone I ran into, but I would like to say hello to Mutt, to Travis, to Kenny, and Matt. Thanks, too, to Mike and Kevin for a ride over the terminal to catch my flight home. My total time on the ground at Knoxville, a record, just two and a half hours, so I wasn't there very long, before I had to catch my commercial flight back to California. Though instead of flying back to Northern California where I live, I flew into the Ontario airport in Southern California as the following day I was scheduled to fly with another Vision Jet owner based in Southern California. The next day I was home for the three-day weekend where I had my first couple of days off since about Christmas. And I must say it was good to have some downtime to recharge my batteries and to work on this episode of the podcast. Now I'm posting a lot of Vision Jet videos and photos on my Facebook and Instagram accounts. So if you're not already following me, Go out to Instagram and look for Aviation News Talk, all one word. And on Facebook, look for Max Trescott. And of course, we have links to both of those in the show notes. And while I was gone flying all last week, I got a ton of comments about last week's episode on special VFR. In fact, we had a record number of downloads for that episode. And I'll read some of those comments after we discuss our main topic today. And I also heard from a number of you who took the plunge and decided to start supporting this show through Patreon or PayPal. 
And if you wonder why I mention this every show, let me point out that we don't take any outside advertising for the show. And Aviation News Talk is largely listener supported. So yes, I work for tips and I greatly appreciate it. When you express your satisfaction with the show by signing up to support us with monthly donations via credit card, which you can do through either Patreon or PayPal. And it's important that we get new supporters each month. Yep, because we lose a few supporters each month for a variety of reasons. And of course, we do have some goodies for you when you sign up. For example, at the $4 a month level, you can get access to the transcripts for each show. And at the $8 a month level, you get the transcripts plus links to the many news stories that we cut out of each show because we didn't have enough time to talk about them all. This week, there were six stories that we cut from the news. At the $20 a month level, we list your name and something about you in those transcripts. And at our new $35 a month level or any of the higher levels, you'll get continual access to my online courses at pilotlearning.com. And when I add new courses to the site, you'll get access to those as well, too. And at the $50 a month level, after two months, I'll send you a copy of one of my books. And last week, I mailed out four autographed books to our supporters. And no matter what level you sign up to support the show at, I'll read your name right here on the show. Now, it's easy to sign up to support the show. Support us via Patreon. Just go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, since you're all awesome listeners. Or go to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. At either of these sites, you can make a monthly donation via credit card, or if you'd like to make a one-time contribution, you can do that via PayPal. And I'd like to thank these new supporters who have joined us in the past week. They include two new mega supporters. Jim Hop edited his pledge up to $50, and Stuart Litjens is a new supporter at the $50 a month level. Other new supporters include Gerald Seaman at the $35 a month level, which includes my online courses at pilotlearning.com. Also, Julian Turacek joined us. Tim Sparks edited his contribution to $8 a month, and David Carter edited his up to $5 a month. And let me now mention our mega supporters, the people who donate $50 a month or more. I mention their name on each of our new shows. And those supporters include Brian Deere, who lives here in Northern California and flies a Turbo 206. Tyson Weiss, co-founder of Flight. Victor Vogel lives in Central PA and flies a Cirrus. Tim Delaney just sent him a book. He's been flying for 50 years and flies an SR-22 in Northern California. Stephen Elop flies a Turbo 182 and a Citation CJ3+. Plus. He's the CEO of API Jet. Mike Williams, president of Kiomac and TCB Composites. They make composite spinners and bulkheads for GA aircraft. And he just got a book in the mail. Seth Lake, he's a new DP giving check rides, and he specializes in teaching the multi-engine rating in his beach travel air. You can find out more about him at vsl.aero. Rick Miller, he instructs in the Cincinnati area, both out of the Lunkin Flight Training Center, as well as with people who own their own aircraft, such as Piper, Cessna's, Beechcraft and Scottis. He says he'd love to teach full-time, but still has that day job. Rick, I can help you with that. <laughs> That's what I did. <laughs> Got rid of the day job, and now I teach all the time. Justin Winter, licensed for three years, flies a 2019 SR-22T. Carl and Ayn Rossi of Maine Coon Cat Aviation, proud owners and operators of three Cessna T-240 aircraft. Johnny McDade, singer, songwriter, musician, and record publisher. Jim Goldfuss, who's just returned from a long hiatus from flying, now working to get his CFI and double I. He wants to instruct full-time on Long Island. Charlie Mason flies out of Santa Monica after being out of flying for a long time, and he's getting checked out in a Cirrus SR-20. Vincent Salimi, he's a council member for the city of Pinole, California, and he's the owner of Salimi Construction Management in San Francisco. Stephen Smart, he flies a Pilatus PC-12 for Part 135 Air Ambulance Operation in Arkansas. He also flies a Piper Meridian and a Cessna 210. And our two new mega supporters, Jim Hopp and Stuart Litchens, and I'll tell you more about them on our next news show. And now in a moment, we're going to talk about wake turbulence right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Okay, let's talk about wake turbulence. I have only had two encounters with wake turbulence in my over 40 years of flying, but one of them was last week, which is why I thought I'd talk about the topic now. Here's what happened. I was flying with one of the several Vision Jet owners that I fly with into San Jose International Airport. And we had the autopilot on and coupled to the RNAV GPS approach to 30 left. I'm guessing we were perhaps about 2,000 feet above the ground when the aircraft suddenly rolled right to about 45 degrees of bank before the autopilot righted the aircraft. Now, I would hate to think how much farther to the right we would have rolled if the autopilot wasn't on. Now, here's how we got into the situation. When we were cleared for the approach, we were advised that we were following a heavy Boeing 767 that was six miles ahead of us and landing on 30 right, and the controller added caution wake turbulence. 
I knew that heavier aircraft generate greater amounts of wake turbulence, but I thought the six miles would be sufficient for the wake turbulence to dissipate before we reached it. Also, since he was landing on a parallel runway, I thought that would give us an additional separation from his wake turbulence. We'll talk more about the characteristics of wake turbulence in a moment, but one of them is that at altitude, wake turbulence tends to descend at a rate of several hundred feet per minute. I don't recall our approach speed, but it was certainly less than 180 knots, which means that we were traveling at least two minutes behind the 767. Therefore, its wake turbulence should theoretically be at least five to 600 feet below us at every point along the approach. Thus, I figured that we would be above his wake turbulence for our descent along the glide slope. But it didn't occur to me until afterwards that it would have been smarter for us to fly above the glide slope during our descent to ensure that we stayed above the Boeing 767's wake turbulence. For example, if that aircraft were flying above the glide slope, then his wake turbulence would be descending down to the glide slope, which is where we were. Of course, had we done that, we wouldn't have been able to use the autopilot's approach mode to track the glide slope. Instead, we would have had to use another mode, such as vertical speed mode, and continually made adjustments to it to try to stay, for example, one dot high above the glide slope. But you can bet that's exactly what I will do in the future if I ever encounter a similar situation. Interestingly, it was at that very same airport at which the owner of a flying club that I used to belong to had a much worse encounter with wake turbulence. He was flying a Cessna 170 into San Jose International about 20 years ago. When he was about 200 feet above the ground on short final, the aircraft rolled into a 90-degree bank. Now, Frank is an older gentleman, but he's also a former member of the Royal Air Force, and he was able to recover and land safely. I remember asking him afterwards whether he had just continued to roll the aircraft in the same direction to complete a 360-degree roll, and he said, no, the wake turbulence wasn't so strong that he had to do that. Now, Frank was lucky to survive, but many other pilots have not survived their encounters with wake turbulence. Here are just a few of the many accidents that occurred because of wake turbulence. On June 23, 1998, at the John Wayne Airport in Southern California, while a solo student pilot of a Cessna 152 was on a downward leg for landing, the air traffic controller directed the student's attention to a Boeing 757 aircraft that was preceding the student's aircraft for landing on the parallel runway. The threshold of the parallel runway is a beam and 500 feet to the right of the runway the student was to land on. The controller then advised of a 10-knot quartering headwind from the right, issued a wake turbulence precaution, and cleared the student pilot for the landing option. Witnesses reported that as the student pilot was on final approach, descending through approximately 100 feet AGL, the aircraft abruptly rolled inverted and crashed short of the runway threshold. The NTSB prepared a study of wake turbulence encounter using data from the 757's flight data recorder, tower communication tapes, and tower reported surface winds. The report concluded that the Cessna 152 descended into the 757's wake when the wake was 37 to 41 seconds old. The student's flight instructor told the safety board that the student, who had 136 hours of dual instruction and 20 hours of solo flight time, had received instruction on wake turbulence avoidance at three points in ground instruction. Furthermore, the instructor said that training as they had at an air carrier airport, most flights involved wake turbulence avoidance. The NTSB determined the probable cause to be the failure of the pilot in command to identify a proper touchdown point on the runway and maintain an appropriate glide path so as to remain clear of vortex turbulence from the preceding large aircraft. A factor in the accident was the pilot's failure to initiate a go-around in the known presence of vortex turbulence. Now, that accident was caused by wake turbulence from an airliner, but helicopters can also create severe wake turbulence. On October 2nd, 2017, about 10.48 a.m., a Cessna 182 was substantially damaged when it impacted terrain during landing at Fernando Luis Ribad Dominique Airport, that's SIG, in San Juan, Puerto Rico. The private pilot was fatally injured, and a pilot-rated passenger was seriously injured. According to the air traffic controller, the pilot was cleared to land on runway 9 behind a flight of two Black Hawk helicopters. The pilot reported that he had the helicopters in sight. While on short final for landing, the pilot was given clearance to land after the helicopters had cleared the runway at the Bravo 4 intersection. The controller reported that the plane was still airborne, passing Bravo 2 intersection, and touched down about 500 feet before the Bravo 3 intersection. The airplane then bounced and came to rest inverted in the grass between the runway and the taxiway. The passenger who was in the right seat reported that approaching the airport for landing, he heard the tower controller tell a Cessna 172 to go around, clear a Cessna citation to land, and clear a pair of Black Hawk helicopters to land behind the citation. 
The accident pilot turned onto the base log of the traffic pattern and was subsequently cleared to land behind the helicopters. After turning final, he and the pilot noted some turbulence that they assumed was from the helicopters. The tower controller then instructed the pilot to complete S-turns. The passenger estimated that the helicopters would still be in hover taxi over the runway when they arrived over the threshold, so the pilot asked the controller to confirm that they were still cleared to land. The controller responded that the airplane was cleared to land. As the airplane crossed the runway threshold, the Blackhawks were turning off the runway. The pilot and the passenger immediately felt a heavy downdraft and thought that the airplane would hit the runway hard. As the airplane was about to touch down, it encountered another burst which pitched the airplane hard to the left. They announced that they were going around and the pilot turned the airplane to the right. As the pilot added power, the airplane encountered another burst and pitched straight up. About 50 to 100 feet above the ground, the airplane rolled inverted and impacted the grass between the taxiway and runway with full power. And I found a similar story in NASA's ASRS database. In their callback newsletter, NASA wrote, Helicopter wakes may be of significantly greater strength than those from a fixed-wing aircraft of the same weight. The strongest wake can occur when the helicopter is operating at lower speeds, 20 to 50 knots, as discovered by one GA fixed-wing pilot. In that accident, the pilot reported he flew above where a light helicopter had landed and didn't believe the helicopter's rotor wash would be a factor. Approximately two to 300 feet past the runway threshold, the aircraft suddenly rolled right, yawed right, and sank. Opposite control input failed to arrest the roller sink, however, it did seem to slow the yaw. The aircraft impacted the ground, right wing low, yawed slightly right and nose high. The aircraft became airborne again, and I was able to maintain control and land in the grass parallel to the runway. Damage included collapsed nose gear assembly, prop strike, gear doors, and lower cowl. The event was classified as an incident rather than an accident, and they say that rotor vortices circulate outward, upward, around, and away from the main rotors in all direction. Miles of small aircraft should operate three or more rotor diameters away from any helicopter in a slow hover taxi or stationary hover. Now, it's not just small light Cessnas like the ones I've talked about that have wake turbulence accidents. On December 15th, 1993, a chartered West Wind business jet carrying two crew members and three passengers, including Rick Snyder, the president of In-N-Out Burger, crashed while on approach for a landing at the John Wayne Airport. All were killed. And this is what it says in that report. It says a beach liner, Boeing 757, and Israeli Westwind were vectored for landing on runway 19 right. 757 and Westwind were sequenced for visual approaches behind the beach. Before being cleared for a visual approach, the Westwind was closing 3.5 miles from the 757 on a converging course. The 757 and Westwind crews were told to slow to 150 knots. 757 slowed below 150 knots and was high on final approach with a 5.6 degree descent. The west wind continued to converge to about 2.1 miles behind the 757 on a 3 degree approach. ATC did not specifically advise and was not required by ATC handbook to advise the west wind pilots that they were behind a Boeing 757. Captain discussed possible wake turbulence, flew the ILS 1 dot high, and noted the closeness to the 757 and indicated there should be no problem. While descending through approximately 1,100 feet MSL, the west wind and counterweight turbulence from the 757 rolled into a steep descent and crashed. The NTSB determined the probable cause of this accident to be the pilot in command's failure to maintain adequate separation behind the Boeing 757 and or remain above its flight path during the approach, which resulted in an encounter with wake vortices from the 757. Factors related to the accident were an inadequacy in ATC procedure related to visual approaches and VFR operations behind heavier airplanes, and the resultant lack of information to the West Wind pilots for them to determine the relative flight path of their airplane with respect to the Boeing 757's flight path. And I found an article about this crash in the LA Times, and it said, quote, the crash investigation resulted in a new federal aviation rule requiring enough time between heavy aircraft and following light aircraft to allow wake turbulence to diminish. Now, a good source of information about wake turbulence is the Aeronautical Information Manual, the AIM, and Section 3 is called Wake Turbulence. It says, every aircraft generates a wake while in flight. This disturbance is caused by a pair of counter-rotating vortices trailing from wingtips. The vortices from larger aircraft pose problems to encountering aircraft. For example, the wake of these aircraft can impose rolling moments exceeding the roll control authority of the encountering aircraft. Further, 
Turbulence generated within the vortices can damage aircraft components and equipment if encountered at close range. The pilot must learn to envision the location of the vortex wake generated by larger aircraft and adjust the flight path accordingly. During ground operations and during takeoff, jet engine blasts can cause damage and upsets if encountered at close range. Exhaust velocity versus distance studies at various thrust levels have shown a need for light aircraft to maintain an adequate separation behind large turboprop aircraft. Pilots of larger aircraft should be particularly careful to consider the effects of their jet blast on other aircraft vehicles and maintenance equipment during ground operations. And next, the AIM talks about vortex strength. It says the strength of the vortex is governed by the weight, speed, and shape of the wing of the generating aircraft. The vortex characteristic of any given aircraft can also be changed by extension of flaps or other wing configuring devices, as well as by change in speed. However, as the basic factor is weight, the vortex strength increases proportionally. Peak vortex tangential speeds exceeding 300 feet per second have been recorded. The greatest vortex strength occurs when the generating aircraft is heavy, clean, and slow. So clean, of course, means that it does not have the landing gear down. Next, they talk about induced roll. They say in rare instances, a wake encounter could cause in-flight structural damage of catastrophic proportions. However, the usual hazard is associated with induced rolling moments, which can exceed the roll control authority of the encountering aircraft. In flight experiments, aircraft have been intentionally flown directly up trailing vortices of larger aircraft. It was shown that the capability of an aircraft to counteract the roll imposed by a wake vortex primarily depends on the wingspan and counter control responsiveness of the encountering aircraft. Counter control is usually effective and induced roll minimal in cases where the wingspan and ailerons of the encountering aircraft extend beyond the rotational flow field of the vortex. It is more difficult for aircraft with short wingspans, that is, short relative to the generating aircraft, to counter the imposed roll induced by vortex flow. Pilots of short span aircraft, even of the high performance type, must be especially alert to vortex encounters. And it goes on to say trailing vortices have certain behavioral characteristics which can help a pilot visualize the wake location and thereby take avoidance precautions. An aircraft generates vortices from the moment it rotates on takeoff to touchdown since trailing vortices are a byproduct of wing lift. Prior to takeoff or touchdown, pilots should note the rotation or touchdown point of the preceding aircraft. The vortex circulation is outward, upward, and around the wingtips when viewed from either ahead or behind the aircraft. Tests with large aircraft have shown that the vortices remain spaced a bit less than a wingspan apart, drifting with the winds at altitudes greater than a wingspan from the ground. In view of this, if persistent vortex turbulence is encountered, a slight change of altitude and lateral position, preferably upwind, will provide a flight path clear of the turbulence. Flight paths have shown that the vortices from large aircraft sink at a rate of several hundred feet per minute, slowing their descent and diminishing in strength with time and distance behind the generating aircraft. Atmospheric turbulence hastens breakup. Pilots should fly at or above the preceding aircraft's flight path, altering course as necessary to avoid the area behind and below the generating aircraft. However, Vertical separation of 1,000 feet may be considered safe. And I think there's one change that's been made to that. I know there was an accident in Europe a few years ago in which an aircraft was 1,000 feet below an A380 flying in the opposite direction, and it experienced severe wake turbulence. So I think when you're talking about A380s, 2,000 feet is now considered a safe distance below those aircraft. And it continues on, when the vortices of larger aircraft sink close to the ground, within 1 to 200 feet of the ground, they tend to move laterally over the ground at a speed of two to three knots. A crosswind will decrease the lateral movement of the upwind vortex and increase the movement of the downwind vortex. Thus, a light wind with a crosswind component of one to five knots could result in the upwind vortex remaining in the touchdown zone for a period of time and hasten the drift of the downwind vortex toward another runway. Similarly, a tailwind condition can move the vortices of the preceding aircraft forward into the touchdown zone. The light quartering tailwind requires maximum caution. Pilots should be alert to large aircraft upwind from their approach and take off flight paths. And they talk about operational problem areas. A wake encounter can be catastrophic. In 1972 at Fort Worth, a DC-9 got too close to a DC-10. They were two miles apart. Rolled, caught a wingtip, and cartwheeled coming to rest in an inverted position on the runway. All aboard were killed. Serious and even fatal GA accidents induced by wake vortices are not uncommon. 
However, a wake encounter is not necessarily hazardous. It can be one or more jolts with varying severity, depending upon the direction of the encounter, weight of the generating aircraft, size of the encountering aircraft, distance from the generating aircraft, and point of vortex encounter. The probability of induced roll increases when the encountering aircraft's heading is generally aligned with the flight path of the generating aircraft. Avoid the area below and behind the generating aircraft, especially at low altitude, where even a momentary wake encounter could be hazardous. Now, this is not easy to do. Some accidents have occurred even though the pilot of the trailing aircraft had carefully noted that the aircraft in front was at a considerably lower altitude. Unfortunately, this does not ensure that the flight path of the lead aircraft will be below that of the trailing aircraft. And it says that pilots should be particularly alert in calm wind conditions and situations where the vortices could remain in the touchdown area, drift from the aircraft operating on a nearby runway, sink into the takeoff or landing pattern from a crossing runway, sink into the traffic pattern from other aircraft operations, or sink into the flight path of VFR aircraft operating on the hemispheric altitude 500 feet below. Pilots of all aircraft should visualize the location of the vortex trail behind larger aircraft and use proper vortex avoidance procedures to achieve safe operation. It is equally important that pilots of larger aircraft plan or adjust their flight paths to minimize vortex exposure to other aircraft. Now let's talk about vortex avoidance procedures. Under certain conditions, airport traffic controllers apply procedures for separating IFR aircraft. If a pilot accepts a clearance to visually follow a preceding aircraft, the pilot accepts responsibility for separation and wake turbulence avoidance. The controllers will also provide to VFR aircraft with whom they are in communication and which in the tower's opinion may be adversely affected by wake turbulence from a larger aircraft, the position, altitude, and direction of flight of larger aircraft followed by the phrase, caution wake turbulence. After issuing the caution for wake turbulence, the airport traffic controllers generally do not provide additional information to the following aircraft unless the airport traffic controllers know the following aircraft is overtaking the preceding aircraft. Whether or not a warning or information has been given, however, the pilot is expected to adjust aircraft operations and flight paths as necessary to preclude serious wake encounters. When any doubt exists about maintaining safe separation distances between aircraft during approaches, pilots should ask the control tower for updates on separation distance and aircraft ground speed. Now, the following vortex avoidance procedures are recommended for the various situations described. Landing behind a larger aircraft on the same runway, stay at or above the larger aircraft's final approach flight path, note its touchdown point, and land beyond it. If you're landing behind a larger aircraft when the parallel runway is closer than 2,500 feet, consider possible drift to your runway. Stay at or above the larger aircraft's final approach path, note its touchdown point. Landing behind a larger aircraft on a crossing runway, cross above the larger aircraft's flight path, Landing behind a departing larger aircraft on the same runway, note the larger aircraft's rotation point and land well prior to the rotation point. Landing behind a departing larger aircraft on a crossing runway, note the larger aircraft's rotation point. If past the intersection, continue the approach, land prior to the intersection. If larger aircraft rotates prior to the intersection, avoid flight below the larger aircraft's flight path. Abandon the approach unless a landing is ensured well before reaching the intersection. And departing behind a larger aircraft, note the larger aircraft's rotation point and rotate prior to the larger aircraft's rotation point. Continue climbing above the larger aircraft's climb path until turning clear of the larger aircraft's weight. Now, my uh, comment on this is, in general, piston aircraft can't outclimb a departing jet. So in this particular case, if you're departing behind a larger aircraft, don't just count on climbing above their path. Soon after takeoff, turn, I would say, at least 20 degrees away from the runway heading so that you don't end up below the wake turbulence of a departing aircraft. And it says avoid subsequent headings which will cross below and behind a larger aircraft. Be alert for any critical takeoff situation which could lead to a vortex encounter. Intersection takeoffs on the same runway. Be alert to adjacent larger aircraft operations, particularly upwind of your runway if intersection takeoff clearance is received. Avoid subsequent headings which will cross below a larger aircraft's pass. Departing or landing after a larger aircraft executes a low approach, missed approach, or touch-and-go landing. Because vortices settle and move laterally near the ground, the vortex hazard may exist along the runway and in your flight path after a larger aircraft has executed a low approach, missed approach, or a touch-and-go landing 
particularly in light quartering wind conditions. You should ensure that an interval of at least two minutes has elapsed before your takeoff or landing. Now, when you're en route and you're flying a VFR, 1,000 foot altitudes plus 500 feet, it says avoid flight below and behind a large aircraft's path. If a larger aircraft is observed above on the same track, either meeting or overtaking you, adjust your position laterally, preferably upwind. Helicopters. In a slow hover taxi or a stationary hover near the surface, helicopters' main rotors generate downwash, producing high-velocity outwash vortices to a distance approximately three times the diameter of the rotor. Pilots of small aircraft should avoid operating within three rotor diameters of any helicopter in a slow hover taxi or stationary hover. In forward flight, departing or landing helicopters produce a pair of strong, high-speed trailing vortices similar to wingtip vortices of larger fixed-wing aircraft. Pilots of small aircraft should use caution when operating behind or crossing behind landing and departing helicopters. Pilots of aircraft that produce strong wake vortices should fly as closely as possible to the approach course centerline or to the extended centerline of the runway of intended landing as appropriate to conditions. Pilots operating lighter aircraft on visual approaches and trail to aircraft producing strong wake vortices should use the following procedures to assist in avoiding wake turbulence. These procedures apply only to those aircraft that are on visual approaches. Pilots of lighter aircraft should fly on or above the glide path. Glide path reference may be furnished by an ILS, by a visual approach slope system, or other ground-based approach slope guidance systems, or by other means. In the absence of visible glide path guidance, pilots may very nearly duplicate a 3-degree glide slope by adhering to the 3-to-1 glide path principle. They give an example here. They say, Fly 3,000 feet above the ground at 10 miles from touchdown, 1,500 feet above at 5 miles, 1,200 feet at 4 miles, and so on to touchdown. If the pilot of the lighter following aircraft has visual contact with a preceding heavier aircraft and also with the runway, the pilot may further adjust for possible wake vortex turbulence by the following practice. Pick a point of landing no less than 1,000 feet from the arrival end of the runway. Establish a line of sight to that landing point that is above and in front of the heavier preceding aircraft. When possible, note the point of landing of the heavier preceding aircraft and adjust point of intended landing. And they give an example. They say a puff of smoke may appear at the 1,000-foot marking on the runway, showing that touchdown was at that point. Therefore, adjust your point of intended landing to the 1,500-foot markings. Maintain the line of sight to the point of intended landing above and ahead of the heavier preceding aircraft. Maintain it to touchdown. Land beyond the point of landing of the preceding heavier aircraft. During visual approaches, pilots may ask ATC for updates on separation and ground speed with respect to heavier preceding aircraft, especially when there is any question of safe separation from wake turbulence. Well, there you have it. What you need to know about wake turbulence. Coming up next, listener feedback right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And we had lots of feedback regarding episode 137's topic of special VFR. All these comments come from my LinkedIn account. Uh, this comes from Craig. He says, SVFR in South Louisiana is almost a daily event in the winter. Without this ability, oil and gas industry would be stunted. SVFR is essential and commonplace to helicopter operations in this arena. Used properly, it is efficient with ceilings between 600 to 1,000 feet. Some Class D airspace will utilize highly traveled designated routes. Some don't. And from William, he says, I used to work for a scheduled 135 operator in western Alaska. Single-engine piston requires VFR operations. Thus, SVFR is commonplace. Spent many hours in SVFR holding pattern with low ceiling and limited visibility waiting for IFR traffic to clear. And this comes from John down in Southern California. He says, Max, 25 or so years ago when I was flying in south-central Alaska, I used it frequently. It did so safely. It just depends on circumstances. And from Rich, he says, Max, I've been flying for more than 50 years, have my FAA Wright Pilot Award, and only need one hand to count the number of times I've used special VFR. You should use this provision sparingly and only in situations where you know the local area well. And yes, I totally agree with you, Rich. I've used it probably fewer than five times as well in my 40 plus years. And this comes from Colin. He's an airline captain. He says, Max, I was going to use it one time when I was a very low time private pilot. I had waited for the weather in Houston to lift so I could get home to Iowa. When I called to get the clearance, the controller informed me that the weather had just lifted to VFR conditions. I took off VFR. Shortly after takeoff, the buildings I saw in front of me were now hidden due to rapidly declining visibility. 
I returned to KHOU and sat a couple more days. I had no desire to use SVFR again. And from Kurt, he says, used special VFR a few weeks ago at the Palo Alto Airport, which is my home airport here in Northern California. He said the southwest side of the airport was down to about 300 feet, but the northeast side was well above 1,500 feet. So he's talking about the cloud ceilings here. I never saw the airport on the GPS approach, but the controllers suggested the VOR approach, which comes in at a different angle. and told me the plane ahead of me saw the runway, but was too close to land from the approach and used special VFR to fly the pattern and land. Worked beautifully for me as well. And finally, Peter from Australia, a good friend of mine, used to be a flight instructor here. He says, Hayward to Palo Alto. Palo Alto was clear. Hayward, low clouds. I had just come from Palo Alto, so I knew where the cloud bank ended. I zipped past the pile of folks waiting for their IFR clearances and was out of there in no time. I'm pretty sure my request and clearance sparked some cockpit conversations. And let's move over to comments that were posted on Facebook. This comes from Jim. He says, as a professional helicopter pilot for 50 years, I used it all the time. I realize private airplane pilots don't, and that's a good thing. Bruce says, I don't recall doing special VFR, but I performed a contact approach within the last year. Napa Airport, that's K-A-P-C, when all approaches but one were notum not available due to runway renumbering. And Ed says, I used SVFR as an instrument rated pilot primarily to get into an airport where the weather is below minimums for the published instrument approach. For example, the approach into my home airport, Auburn, S50, has a minimum descent altitude of 920 feet. If the weather is below that, I'll fly the ILS into Boeing Field, BFI, in order to get below the clouds and then get a special VFR clearance to Auburn, which is 12 miles away. And Paul says, used to fly out of Palomar and Carlsbad, that's in Southern California, where some mornings the marine layer would be just off the west end of the runway, but severe clear from there east. We would get special VFR as long as the wind was calm and depart on runway 9 with no issues several hours before the field went VFR. Very handy. And finally from Patrick, he says, When I was getting my private in Southern California during the late 1970s, my instructor used special VFR to get our Cessna 150 from Fullerton, that's KFUL, to the practice area almost every day to get around the smoke and haze. No one I remember used SVFR for tooling around in the haze just to get away from it. And if you'd like to follow me and post comments every time I post a notice that a new show is up, just go out to either LinkedIn or Facebook and look for Max Trescott. And on Instagram, look for Aviation News Talk, all one word. And of course, if you're thinking about someday buying a new Cirrus, call me, 650-967-2500. Free consultation. Be happy to share with you some of the ins and outs of buying new versus used. I specialize in the Cirrus and work with people around the world. And of course, if you haven't clicked on the subscribe button yet, please go ahead and do that. That way the shows will be downloaded automatically to you each week. And if your aviation friends don't know about Aviation News Talk, please tell them about it. It's easy to get the show if they're not familiar with podcasts. Just go out to the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. Search for our dedicated app, which is called Aviation News Talk, and you can download it for free. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up.